Hey everyone, it's Sylvie here and you're watching Wild Encounters with the BC Wildlife Park. Our motto here at the park is conservation through education. So that means it's my job as an educator to share information about wildlife and wild places to start a conversation about protecting our planet. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most important groups of animals for both the ecosystem and the people here in British Columbia. We're talking about Pacific salmon and I have so much to show you and to share with you. So follow along with me and I'll introduce you to some young salmon. We'll talk about the circle of life for salmon in the wild and then we'll take some field trips out to the salmon run and to release our captive raised salmon. Let's get started. Let's begin with our salmon here in the BC Wildlife Park classroom. With me today I have 16 coho salmon fry who are about a year old. I actually got to raise these salmon along with my co-workers here in the education department from the time these fish were just eggs. We got them through the Stream to Sea program run by the Big Little Science Centre and this is an initiative to help increase the chance of survival for young salmon during the most vulnerable stages of their life, all while providing the opportunity for hands-on learning in schools and community groups. These salmon's parents were spawning last year at the Dunn Creek Hatchery managed and operated by the Simp Nation. This hatchery exists to raise coho salmon to help support local waterways and increase native coho salmon stocks. So the Simp Nation collected some spawning salmon for the Stream to Sea program and the Big Little Science Centre brought them to us and to all the other participants in the program. We got to help extract eggs and milt from the spawning salmon, fertilize the eggs and then watch them grow and develop right here in this aquarium. We started out with about 80 eggs and every single one of them hatched. We raised them to the point of being fry and then most of them have already been released back into their home stream to help boost native coho salmon populations. We had these 16 stay behind to have the chance to watch them grow up a little bit more before we let them go. Let's talk a bit about what's unique about coho salmon. They are one of five species of Pacific salmon, the others being sockeye, chinook, chum and pink. They can be found in most BC coastal streams and all along the Pacific coast from Alaska down to California. In BC there are actually more distinct populations of coho than any of the other Pacific salmon species. Like all of the other Pacific salmon, coho are an anadromous species which means they're born in freshwater, they move to salt water for their adult lives and then they return to freshwater to spawn or to reproduce at the end of their lives. Each species will spend a different amount of time in freshwater, but for coho it's usually one year, though it can be two or even three in northern populations. It can be difficult to tell the different species of salmon apart as fry, but coho are generally a more colorful species known for their orangish fins. They also have distinctly larger eyes than the other species. Juvenile coho like to live in all kinds of freshwater habitats, including streams, sloughs, ponds, lakes, and rivers. They're quite territorial in these habitats as defending their territory is their number one survival mechanism. They defend their territory using physical maneuvers including a shimmy shake action known in the scientific community as the wigwag dance. When coho head to the ocean they morph into their adult form which can be identified by silver sides and a metallic blue back with irregular black spots. Adult coho are known for their active and powerful nature and their tendency to stay near coastlines as opposed to migrating seasonally across the open ocean like other salmon. After about 18 months in salt water at around three years of age, the coho will return to their natal streams to spawn. When spawning, they become bright red with a bright green back and a dark belly. Males develop a prominent hooked jaw with sharp teeth and females develop a somewhat hooked jaw. The coho finish their lives by laying a few thousand eggs in their natal streams and then dying, returning their energy to the earth. Now what I really want to talk about with these salmon is their life cycles, because the journey they take and the transformations that happen within their bodies are among the most fascinating phenomena in nature. And these fish are critically important to their ecosystems at every step of the way. Pacific salmon are considered keystone species, which means that their ecosystems depend on them and would be in danger without them and this applies at every life stage. Pacific salmon begin life in the fall as eggs. Eggs are deposited by a spawning female in a nest known as a red and fertilized with milt by a spawning male. The female will deposit approximately 1,000 eggs in a red and cover them with gravel after they've been fertilized. The male and female will repeat the fertilization process several times until all of the female's eggs have been deposited. After being fertilized, the eggs need to rest under the gravel in still, dark, cold water in order to develop properly. After a few weeks, they'll show the first signs of life when they become eyed eggs, 
and the eye of the embryo inside will become visible through the translucent casing of the egg. When the salmon break out of their eggs, they're called alevin. Alevins still need to live in the dark underneath the gravel, and they couldn't even swim out if they wanted to because their swim bladders aren't inflated yet. But this doesn't matter. They don't need to swim because they don't need to find food. The yolk sac from their egg is attached to their body, and this is the only food they need at this point in their life. They gradually absorb the nutrients from the yolk into their bodies until that yolk sac is all gone. In the spring, the young salmon will take a breath of oxygen to inflate their swim bladders and emerge from the gravel as fry. During the fry stage, the fish need to start eating and they'll survive on a diet of small zooplankton and insects. The fry will either head straight to the ocean, in the case of the chum and pink species, stay in fresh water for two or even three years, in the case of sockeye, or somewhere in between for coho and chinook. If they stay in fresh water, they'll find a habitat in a stream, slough, pond, lake, or wherever they can find enough shelter. They need to have rocks and coarse woody debris to hide in and a healthy riparian area surrounding their aquatic habitat to provide shade to keep the water cold and to provide insects for food. As the fry grow in their freshwater habitats, they'll develop stripes along their flanks called par marks, which help them camouflage. This is sometimes considered its own life stage called the par stage. Eventually, environmental cues will trigger the fish to start swimming downstream toward the ocean. They'll carefully smell the water in their natal streams to imprint on the odor so they can find it again in a few years' time when they return to spawn. The phenomenon of large numbers of fry traveling toward the ocean is known as the invisible migration. This is one of the largest migrations in the world, but it's called the invisible migration because it's performed underwater by tiny, well-camouflaged fish so it's easy for it to go unnoticed by us humans. During the invisible migration, the young salmon undergo physical changes as they enter a new life stage, the smolt stage. Their scales grow and become silvery in color, their bodies become more streamlined and buoyant, and they begin the smoltification process as they arrive in an estuary. Here, salt water mixes with fresh water, and the smoltification process allows them to gradually adjust to that salt. This is a process in which the salmon's bodies learn to filter salt out of the body instead of keeping it in. This is all part of osmoregulation, which is maintaining the correct balance of fluids to electrolytes or salts within the body. In fresh water, the fish's body is saltier than the water it swims in, so it constantly needs to replenish its salt content through its diet. In the ocean, it's the opposite. The water is saltier than the body, and salt water actually dehydrates the fish because it pulls fluid out of the cells. During smoltification, they gain the ability to hydrate themselves by drinking salt water, as they can then filter the salt out through their gills or their urine. This is an ability that non-anadromous freshwater fish will never develop. When the smolts are fully adjusted to salt water, they can continue their journey and move on to the ocean. From egg to smolt, the role of salmon in the ecosystem is that of predator, prey, and indicator. Juvenile salmon and salmon eggs are important nutrient-rich foods for predators like birds, reptiles, mammals, and fish, and these animals depend on the salmon for a significant portion of their diet during the time of year that they're most abundant. Salmon are also important predators during their juvenile stages of life, and they control populations of zooplankton, crustaceans, and insects. From the very beginning of their life at the egg stage, salmon are also indicator species, which means that they're directly and immediately affected by changes in the habitat as a whole. This means that changes in young salmon populations alert researchers that something has changed in the river ecosystem. The next part of the salmon's life is the adult stage, which it spends in the ocean. During this stage, their bodies become shiny and silver in color to help them camouflage in open water. They also undergo other physiological changes, developing hard scales, a strong jaw, and sharp teeth for protection, and to compete for food in the challenging ocean environment. For one to four years, depending on the species, Pacific salmon will make seasonal migrations hundreds or thousands of kilometers across the open ocean, moving between feeding grounds that supply them with squid, zooplankton, and small fish for their diets. Coho tend to stay near shorelines and avoid these migrations, but the other four species will be traveling across the ocean. As adults, Pacific salmon continue to play important ecological roles. Many species of marine life depend on salmon as an important part of their diets. A key predator of salmon is the killer whale, which is an endangered species. If those killer whales no longer had salmon to eat, they would likely become extinct. Salmon are also predators themselves for prey species like zooplankton, 
squid and smaller fish, and they keep those populations controlled and healthy. A lesser known ecological role of salmon is the accumulation of marine nutrients like phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon inside of their bodies. This doesn't directly benefit the ecosystem at this stage in life, but it's an important step to take in preparation for the benefits it will bring in the next. We haven't finished the life cycle of the salmon just yet. There's one last important journey that the fish need to make. But rather than talking about it here in the classroom, I think we should go on a little journey of our own to see where the Pacific salmon are completing their life cycles right now. Let's go check out the salmon run at Adams River. Here we are at Chuchwag Provincial Park, home of the quadrennial Salute to the Sockeye event. Every four years, a dominant salmon run year occurs, which means that more salmon return to spawn in these years than in others. This year is a dominant year, so it's a perfect opportunity to come out and learn how salmon finish off their lives and keep this beautiful habitat alive and well. Here the river is full of spawning salmon returning to their natal streams to spawn. A few weeks ago, these salmon were in the ocean and their biological clocks compelled them to return here where they were born. At that point, when they left the ocean, their only goal became to use all their energy to return here to begin the life cycle anew. Let's try to get a closer look at them to see what this spawning stage looks like. The salmon have undergone physical changes, turning various shades of red and dark green depending on the species, and this is thought to be an adaptation for attracting a mate. Males develop a hooked mouth called a kipe with large canine teeth, and some species form a large hump on their backs. Females undergo a less pronounced but very similar transformation. The increased strength in the mouth and jaw structure in both sexes is an adaptation for defending the red. The physical characteristics developed during the spawning phase are known as secondary sexual characteristics, and because the salmon no longer eat, they have to use the stored protein and fat reserves in their bodies to fuel the transformation. Having pronounced secondary sexual characteristics is likely to attract a mate in the case of both males and females, as it's a sign that the fish was healthy and well-fed during life in the ocean. Spawning salmon also use the remaining fat and protein reserves as energy to make the grueling journey back to their natal streams. They swim hundreds of kilometers upstream or against the river's current before they arrive back at their birthplace. It takes a great deal of strength and power to keep swimming against a raging river's current, and it's amazing that an animal that no longer eats is able to achieve this. The journey takes weeks as a fish from the Kamloops area, for example, would have to leave the Pacific Ocean, travel up the Fraser River and up much of the Thompson River until it arrived back home. Not many salmon will make it back to the natal stream to spawn. Throughout their lives, they have many opportunities to perish due to predation, environmental factors or human-made obstacles. Out of the few thousand eggs laid by a female salmon, only about two will return to the stream to spawn again. These are likely to be the fittest salmon with the most favorable genes to be passed on to the next generation to ensure the survival of the species. A male and female will find each other, the female digs a red and deposits her eggs, and the male fertilizes them with milt. The female buries the eggs with gravel, and then the two of them repeat the process several times. At this point, the fish are exhausted and they've completed their life's mission. They'll spend the last days of their lives using whatever energy they have left to defend the red, and then they pass away. The life cycle will begin again with the newly fertilized eggs. Spawning salmon leave a lasting impact on their ecosystems long after their lives have ended. Both live and dead spawning salmon are a critical food source for many animals like bears, wolves, river otters, birds including eagles and ospreys, and more. The salmon provide these animals with the energy they need to survive winter, and they're especially important for bears who need the protein and other nutrients from the salmon to prepare for hibernation. In the spawning stage of life, salmon again indicate the health of the river ecosystem. If the salmon keep coming back, then we know that the ecosystem is healthy. During salmon runs, ecologists conduct studies in which they count the number of salmon returning to evaluate if the ecosystem is operating as it should. If you remember how the salmon needed to collect nutrients in their bodies during life in the ocean, this is when it becomes so important. They bring those nutrients like phosphorus, nitrogen and carbon back to the river when they come to spawn. A lot of those deep sea nutrients are critically important for the riparian ecosystem, but they aren't naturally found in great quantities here. As the sea salmon's bodies decompose in and around the water, they make all the nutrients stored inside available to all the other life in the area. Without salmon returning from the ocean, dying, and then depositing those nutrients into the soil and water, the ecosystem wouldn't survive. So the death of a salmon is not so much representative of the end of a life as it is the beginning of a wealth of new life throughout the ecosystem. The positive impacts of salmon don't stop there. Pacific salmon have been profoundly important to human life for time immemorial. 
humans have long been benefiting from salmon in terms of food, economy, and culture. Just as many of BC's native animal species depend on salmon as a source of nutrition, so too can humans. Today, many people enjoy eating salmon in a wide array of different cuisines, and historically, Pacific salmon have been and continue to be a central food source for many indigenous populations of the Pacific Northwest. Many traditional methods of preserving salmon, including drying, smoking, and canning, would allow the fish to be eaten year-round. We see Pacific salmon benefit our economies as well. Because salmon are such a highly valued food source, whole industries have been created around them, which create millions of jobs. From fisheries and aquaculture, to hatcheries, to canneries, to wild fish markets, salmon have been creating jobs and generating wealth since the rise of industrialization. Historically, salmon could also be viewed as a form of wealth in itself, as it held great value in trade. Of course, as we can see from this amazing salute to the sockeye event here at Chuchuac Provincial Park, salmon are deeply embedded in human culture, especially the indigenous cultures of the Pacific Northwest. Salmon have been perceived as giving the gift of life through their bodily sacrifice to the earth and to the animals, including the humans who eat them. In this area, the Sequetmik people have long relied on salmon for food while respecting them sustainably through their cultural values of interconnectedness of all living beings. If you ever want to learn more about the cultural significance of salmon in your area, one of the best ways to do that is to visit an event like this, chat with some experts, and read through all of the educational materials provided. When I visited the Salute to the Sockeye event, I went to the cultural tent and met Angelina Wells and Jerry Thomas, who shared some of their knowledge with me. Back in the, probably about the 70s, my mother used to put away 500 salmon a year, uh, every year. And, uh, a lot of the, it was mostly smoked salmon uh, down at our fish camp. And um, that was a family camp, so. And her and dad stayed down there like two weeks doing all the salmon. And um, during the winter time, people came and traded with big sacks of potatoes, cucumbers, whatever they had. And it was traded like that. So, and then back then, they didn't have much of uh, freezers or fridges to put them away. Yeah. And not much of the smoking has happened um, since then, smoking of the salmon. Most of it's been canned and um, probably barbecued, frozen. So we've got to get all that back. And um, every part of the salmon was used. It was, nothing was wasted. The fish, the fish guts, they were thrown back into the lake. We just save it in a bucket. My dad would take it out on a canoe and he'd dump it in the middle of the lake. So that, that's how they, they were taught and they also taught us to do that. We were, I'm kind of worried about the salmon. There's not much has come home. And, but then they say they're, they're, they're in Kamloops. Some of them are still coming home. So we're waiting for them. And uh, they said they wait for the water to cool down for them to continue to come, come home to spawn. That was my last last week um, words I was told. So I'm happy for that, that they're still coming home. Cook's gym. When I see a bear by the river, I watch the bear. He'll take the salmon out of the river. As he takes the salmon out of the river, he'll drag it along the bank with all that slava that he has. He's nutrition the ground of the rivers and stuff like that. And then he'll start taking apart the, the salmon. As he's taking apart the salmon, he's throwing it around. So other animals that can't get out into the river gets the part of the salmon. It's like the, you think of the squirrel that can't go into the fast water, the ants that can't go into fast water, the mice that can't go into fast water, the snakes, they want a piece of salmon. So that's why Bear does that. He takes it all ashore and he shares a little bit of the salmon with all the little people that can't get the salmon. And that's what they do. All the bears, when you're looking along the rivers and you see all the bears, they're taking some of the salmon. They'll take it ashore for the, for the little people that can't get anything. Think of the, like all the animals that 
like the rabbit and anything other animals that are there, the crow and all the seagulls and everything else, they can't get salmon out. So that's why bear helps hunt with the, the salmon. And that's what I was told by the elders. So then that's one of our stories of what do we do with the kids and tell them the stories why you see a bear out in the, the river. Thank you. Sadly, Pacific salmon are not nearly as abundant today as they once were. Scientists believe that Western North America was once home to about 1,400 different salmon populations, but more than a quarter of them are now extinct. The life of a salmon is naturally dangerous. They're constantly facing predators and battling their environmental conditions. But none of these problems have anything to do with the demise of their populations. The real problems are human caused. The main reason salmon have become threatened or endangered can be narrowed down to the four H's. The first is habitat destruction, meaning that human activity like urbanization has damaged or eliminated a great deal of salmon's aquatic habitat. The next is hydroelectric dams. Much of our power in British Columbia comes from the water. We have power in our houses because of dams built on rivers, but they can block salmon from going to and from the ocean. The next is over harvesting. We know it's important for humans to harvest salmon from the oceans and rivers for food and for jobs, but doing so in excess can cause salmon populations to shrink. Traditional indigenous salmon fishing practices emphasize sustainability, whereas industrial and commercial practices tend to be focused on volume. The fourth is hatchery competition. To deal with the over-harvesting issue, we have fish hatcheries where salmon are raised in a controlled space and those fish are harvested for food. However, if they're not well contained, they can compete with wild fish and also interbreed with them. Interbreeding is a problem because hatchery fish have different genes and are not properly adapted to find their way home to the river. In light of climate events in recent years, we could propose a fifth age, which is heat. Heat domes and heat waves may be causing repercussions for Pacific salmon populations as hotter and drier summers cause snow to melt earlier, resulting in a decline in summer stream levels. This makes migration difficult. Salmon also need cold water to survive, and if the climate causes water temperatures to rise too much, entire populations of salmon could be wiped out. Our watersheds are further threatened by other industrial practices like mining, forest clear cutting, and more. In order for our Pacific salmon to prosper for years to come, it's up to us to save them and the ecosystems they sustain. In the past, many salmon restoration efforts have been unsuccessful because they were implemented only after native salmon stocks had been depleted. When those native populations are pushed close to extinction, it's usually too late to reverse whatever damage brought them to that point. Typically, a better strategy is to focus our efforts on preserving our salmon strongholds or the thriving populations. By protecting what is already succeeding, meaning both the river itself and the surrounding riparian area, we can prevent further population declines. While protecting Pacific salmon may seem like a large and daunting task beyond your control, there are things we can do in our everyday lives to help save the salmon. One thing we can do is to save water. So we can do things like taking shorter showers, turning off the tap when brushing your teeth, using low flow toilets and more. Every time we use water, we're contaminating the water and the salmon need that clean water to survive. Another thing we can do is to conserve electricity. Because our electricity comes from the water, we can do things like turning out the lights, turning off electronics when they're not in use, and just using less energy in general. By using less energy, there is less need to build more hydroelectric dams. Another thing we can do is just be careful with chemicals we're using. You can wash your car on the lawn instead of the driveway or the road, avoid dumping chemicals down storm drains, be mindful of what goes down the sink or the toilet, and avoid harsh fertilizers. Any chemicals that get into the water could end up harming the salmon. Something else we can do is practice sustainable gardening. Planting native plants in your garden is helpful because they require less water and chemicals to grow. We can also choose to use compost instead of fertilizer. Something else we can do is stay on trails when hiking or riding our bike. This prevents us from damaging or contaminating wetlands. If you like to eat salmon, you should be aware of where you're purchasing that salmon from. Wild caught fish from small markets is generally the most sustainable, but some hatcheries can be sustainable as well. It's a good idea to research where your food comes from and be aware of how it impacts the planet. Educating yourself, staying informed, and getting involved is always the best way to approach conservation. 
And this, of course, includes learning about traditional indigenous practices and ideologies about protecting life and land. With salmon, there's a lot to be learned about sustainable fishing practices, including dip netting and the use of weirs. For youth, you can talk with your school about getting involved and helping the salmon. You and your class could think about painting storm drains with yellow fish to remind your community that those drains feed directly into local waterways. You could take a field trip to a local salmon run, or you could even join the Stream to Sea program to raise salmon for release into the wild. So now that we've learned how to help the salmon, myself and my colleagues from the BC Wildlife Park are going to follow through with our contribution to salmon conservation and release our coho into the wild where they belong. So we've seen the salmon run and we've learned that spawning season is not just about the end of life for the salmon, it's also about new life and rebirth throughout the ecosystem. So just as the spawning salmon are completing their journey home to the river, a new generation of young fry are just getting ready to make the invisible migration to the ocean. These fry are ready for the next step in life, so we're going to have a ceremony to honor the journey they're about to face as we release them into their home stream. So to get the salmon ready, we're going to fill a bucket with water to put them in. And hopefully the water temperature in the tank is close enough to the river so that the salmon won't be shocked. So our water here is nice and cold and we should be late enough in the season now that the water is cold enough for them to survive. And they're going to stay there all winter in the cold water until the springtime when they'll move on to the ocean. So I'm going to use my siphon and we'll get some water into our big bucket to transport the fish. Now I'm going to carefully scoop the fish out of the water using my net. So all 16 are in the bucket and now we have to act quickly and get them to their release site because they'll run out of oxygen in here in about an hour. So we're here at the release site now and I've met up with Larissa from our animal care team at the BC Wildlife Park. Could you introduce yourself, Larissa? Hi everybody, my name is Larissa. Uh, my traditional name is Sitcha, which translates to raven in the Sahuatnic language. Okay, so we're gonna get our fish acclimated to the water in the river. So we're going to mix the water from the tank with the water from the river. So I'm going to remove some of this water. And we'll scoop some from the river into the bucket. It's a little bit colder, so they need to adjust gradually. So now we'll give them a little bit of time to get adjusted to their new water. And Larissa will get us going with our ceremony. Sagebrush is a traditional medicine for the Sahuatmic people and burning the leaves will cleanse the body prior to ceremony. We will often use the smoke over the drum that is used in the ceremony as well. So, hello everyone. Sitcha Resquez. My name is Sitcha, which means raven. Um, just wanted to acknowledge here that we are at the release site, which is located in Kamloops to Sukhwetmik within Sukhwetmikulu, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Sukhwetmik people. Uh, I'd like to start off our ceremony with a short prayer and a drum to honor the salmon as they're released. Um, so, Kukstam, Kukstam, Kaukukbi, La Swentwa, which means thank you, Creator, for this good day. Yochamin Kukwait to stem Yaana Ritmuch is take care of this land. Kukshjam Retimuch, thank you for the land. Kukshjam Rasalkwa, thank you for the water. Kukshjam Ras Belkwin, thank you for the salmon.
and we'll do the honor song for the little salmon. All right, our fish have had lots of time to get adjusted now, so they shouldn't be shocked when we let them go into the river. So I'm just gonna ease the bucket down and let them swim away. Looks like our fish's instincts are taking over. They're burrowing themselves into some rock crevices, which is a normal and natural behavior for young salmon fry. And I think they're finding some food to eat already. That brings us to the end of this video. Thank you so much for learning about Pacific salmon with me today. If you ever want to learn more about any of BC's wildlife, come visit us in person at the BC Wildlife Park in Kamloops, British Columbia, and chat with our friendly and knowledgeable staff who are always eager to share information. You can also follow us on all of our social media for regular updates on all of our park animals, including our next generation of young salmon we'll be raising through the Stream to Sea program, as well as educational content. I want to extend my thanks to the Big Little Science Center and the Simp Nation for providing the salmon you saw today. And also thanks to our special guests, Jerry, Angelina, and Larissa for sharing their knowledge with us. And once again, thanks so much to you for joining me. I hope to see you at the BC Wildlife Park soon. Bye for now. Bye.